somebody said, how much are the daily devotional upper rooms? And we said, they're free. It's a little gift of love from us. And like all devotions, they're not even. Some days speak to you better than others. But the strange thing is that the day that doesn't speak so well to one speaks well to another. And not very long ago, some of you are getting cold. I see some of you kind of doing this thing. You know, I don't want you to get uh, frozen. It's, uh, you know, okay. Anyway, Make sure that the air in the back, John, is not lower, not higher. You know, 75, please and thank you, if you don't mind. Okay, anyway, I ran into an upper room. Some of y'all want it colder. I know. I can even look at their faces and see. Um, an upper room that talked about beginnings and endings. Some of you that are reading it may have run into that. Uh, it was a very interesting thing because it was about a guy that had come to retirement, and he was strong and he was able and developed a debilitating disease uh, and is having to completely restructure his life now based on the fact that what he thought he was going to be doing is not what he is doing. And so there was an ending to a way of life, and there was a call to a beginning for a new way of life. There are people in our congregation this morning today that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Thank God it's through, but boy, that space in between is sure tough when you're overcome by loss and difficulty. Maybe it's not so much the death of a person as it is the death of a relationship, somebody that you were very close to. Um, somehow or the other, it didn't work the way that you had hoped that it would work. And so we spend our lives uh, drastic uh, changes, some uh, minor, some major. Uh, last week, somebody came and said, I got laid off of my job after having worked there for 27 years. And during this, pe- this season of Lent, we know about that, about the endings and beginnings, about deaths and the hopes for resurrection. And so what do we as a part of God's people have to say to do about that kind of thing? And the very first thing is this, that we need to live freely. We need to choose to live freely. Did you pick that up? To him that loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. If you'll just simply make that choice to try not only to live, but to live well. Not only to live well, but to live large. Uh, We were kidding at the early service about uh, one time I was looking for a sermon. It was one of those weeks where it didn't come early. And... uh, I mean, that's bad enough, but when it's Saturday night and it still ain't there, that's really bad. And it's 1030 at Saturday night, you know, and uh, you've looked all the stuff over. And so I decided that I'd uh, done everything I could devotional wise. And so I'd uh, go and read something that would really move my heart. So I picked up the latest issue of Road and Track magazine. (laughs) And some of you that are car nuts know a little bit about it. And so I'm looking at Road and Track magazine. I'm flipping through the pages, and all of a sudden, I come to this page that says, live large, live fully, live well. Stop living small, live large, buy Volkswagen. (laughs) There's a picture of this beautiful little Volkswagen Jetta there, you know. Do you ever stop to think about the fact that God in the grace that God has given to you to set us free from sin and from self and to deliver us into kinds of new realities is calling you to stop living small and to live large. Is calling you to stop living in a bondage of some kind or the other, and you know it, even if no one else does, and to begin to walk in a brand new glorious freedom. And when you do that, you're going to find several things. First of all, that you are a representative of the kingdom of God. Did you catch that kind of thing where it says the kingdom and priests forever? The kingdom of God sometimes gets really distorted by we theological types. We tell you all these wonderful things about the kingdom of God, but the truth is that if you boil it down to its essence, the kingdom of God that you represent and I represent is simply this, where God is in charge, where God is acknowledged as God, where God is sovereign, where God is Lord, where God is king. Call it what you like, but you know what it is and what it's about. At Spanish class this last Thursday night, we kind of had fun. Um, Our son has been quite sick, and he's coming back online, and he was taking over everything on Thursday night. And uh, now I'm going to give it to you from the class's perspective. They said he was taking over everything from you, Turkey. (laughs) But some of us are the Charles in charge type. And I want to tell you what the economy of the kingdom of God says. You're not in charge. You're responsible. 
you're called to accountability, but in the overall larger issue of things, there is only God. God who was, God who is, and God who will be. And we live under that and in the kingdom of God and also become priests. You and I, priests, what's a priest? It's someone who intervenes for God on behalf of others. In our understanding of Protestant faith and life, that means that you are as accountable to God for your life of ministry as any of us who are ordained is. It means that we're all capable of, able to, and actually called of God to stand in the gap and to be kind of God's representative in a priestly way, in a ministering way, in a serving way, in a loving way. When we begin to do that, things change positively and dramatically. And so the very first thing that this is saying to us is to be sure that you make a point of living free and then to learn how to embrace the new things. You know, one of the interesting things that that devotion pointed out, that that guy said that when his handicap began to be evident, that he had to change everything, but he had to also wait on what was coming toward him. You know, you embrace the moment where you are, but you have to sort of wait to see what the new is going to be. It's the end of this and the beginning of that. Charles West, in his wonderful book, Outside the Camp, begins with this line, we're living between two worlds, one which is dying and the other struggling to be born. What should we do with this reality? It's a good question. And so we need to hold on to that. Uh, Elizabeth, are you here? Is Elizabeth Harrison here today? Did you all read your Lenten devotion for today? Elizabeth's devotion for today. Be sure you read it when you get home if you haven't had to yet. I had a chance to yet. Uh, it's about her brother who lost his wife uh, after a long bout with Alzheimer's. You know the sadness about Alzheimer's? You lose your loved one before you lose your loved one. That's the sad thing about it. But anyway, after that, he began to go to another church. Um, he had moved and began to go to another church, and he's talking about adapting to the end of a relationship and the beginning of all these new relationships. Isn't that it? So that instead of being afraid of the new, you don't know everything that it means, but you sort of embrace the new, knowing that God is with you in that process and that you remain open to it and that the new might turn out to be even better than the other was, that the new might turn out to be glorious and wonderful. It's always going to be challenging, but that it might also turn out to be really neat, really good. The old is important. It has its role to play. But stand and look directly in the face of the new and say, I reach my arms out and take you in. Before we leave that, let me just simply say, a lot of us suffer, including our churches suffer, because we're not willing to do that. We want it the way it's always been. We insist that it's got to stay exactly like that, and we were kidding about it. Come weal or come woe, our status is quo, <laughs> you know. Uh, and if you really are a new person, come weal or come woe, our status is go. And, and I want this to stay in the confines of our church, but I want to say just a little something that Todd's just recently had an unhappy experience because whenever you try to build, there's always somebody that doesn't understand, and they're trying to get rid of an old building um, in order to make way for the new one. The old building is not even useful. You try to walk on the floor, you fall through. Uh, the, the carpet was put down with a glue with formaldehyde in it. Y'all ever been into a morgue and know what it smells like? Um, and so it was a difficult thing. And so uh, in that ending, there were some people that are all upset and wanted to. And that happens every time. It happens in every place. But it's an agony if you love people because what you want to do is not only acknowledge the ending of things, but you want to be there with them when the new building appears. And I'm not talking about the physical building because too many times churches define success in terms of physical building. I'm talking about making a space for some children of God for which there is no space now. Making a place for them. Remember the first name for God in scripture is the place because it provides that moment, that Ebenezer, that place where the divine and the human run into one another. One thing more and we're almost done. When you begin to choose to live freely and to embrace the new, um, also remember that God is going to give you both your nourishment and reward when you do that. Did you notice how the scripture said that you can drink from the spring of the living water? And that's what you do. Drink that kind of stuff into your life. Eat that kind of food into your life that will equip you for the living of these days. 
uh, for the time that God has called you to share on earth. It's too limited anyway, not to fill it to the full, you know. But uh, God really is in the equipment business. There was a minister um, that was a pastor of an inner city church in a slum in London. Matthew Arnold, the writer, the poet, came to know this guy. And he said, the amazing thing about this man is that he was always a person of joy. And his countenance always reflected a sense of joy. He was not dour. Uh, I don't know exactly what dour means, but every now and then when I look at some of us, I see it. Uh, and when you look at some of us, you see it. You know, it's a two-way street. Um, but he said he was not dour. And so he decided one day, and Matthew Arnold was not standard by any Christian definition. Uh, but he asked this man, he said, what is the secret of your joy? What is the secret of your life? And he said, how do you want me to respond? And he said, I want you to respond with total honesty. And he said, then I'll tell you, it's just this simple. Uh, the secret of my life is that I feed on the bread of life, Christ Jesus himself. And you see, it's that bread of life, and you must interpret it in your way. And that fountain that provides for us streams of living water that allows us not only to come to the place, but to be ready to be equipped for the place. And then the reward. The reward is that you've done the right thing. The reward is that you have done well. Boy, is that different from the reward system of the world where reward only means that you got something you didn't have. It means that you have let some things end and some things begin, and in those new beginnings, you've done well. So that when you stand before God, God can say, well done. But what's so very neat about it is contained in a story from Fred Craddock. We talk about Fred Craddock a lot, but Fred Craddock sees the gospel in so many events and so many narrative things. And dear brothers and sisters, if the gospel is not present in the stories of our lives, then the gospel is not present because the gospel is for our lives and in your story. But he said that they had to go to church when they were kids. There were six in the family, um, two girls and four boys, and said grandma took them whether they liked it or not. They went to church every Sunday, and they said they had a series of pastors that would come and go. And the pastors would come in, and uh, most of them were very nice, and they would come up and they would say, well, good morning, Sonny, and pat the little boys on the head. And, good morning, honey, and pat the little girls on the head. And this went on from pastor to pastor, uh, from year to year. And then they got a new pastor, and he was only there a couple of weeks, and he came, and he started from the right, and he said, good morning, William, how are you? Hi, Mary. Gee, your hair looks cute today. How are you, Fred? What's going on? And Fred Craddock said, the distance between Sonny and Fred is infinite. It's the distance between reward and possibility. It's the distance between doing what you feel you should do because it's the right and godly thing to do and the Christ-like thing to do and then hearing God call you by name in a very personal way. I don't think I've ever done this, have I? Read from heart stuff in a service. But I wanted to sort of wrap this up with this. Some of you know that when heart stuff first went to press, they called us and said, the book stops, but it doesn't end. And will you write an ending? And I said, oh, sure, when do you need that? And they said, now. I said, what do you mean now? Like next couple of days? Now. Can you do it on the telephone? And I said, no. And they said, well, do it and uh, call us right back. And so I actually did. I hung the phone up and, um, you know, got on the computer and uh, began to write. Let me see if I can set the stage for us. Endings, beginnings. Beginnings, endings. It's the life of life. It's the life of faith. It's the life of Lent. Ever hate to come to the end, get to the last page, wrap it up, close it down, have it over and done? Me too. There's so much more, so much there, so much to see and do and say. But we've done some of it together, and there's still tomorrow and the day after. So, and this is to you, dear brothers and sisters, thanks for stopping by and coming in. Your coming makes a difference. And we hope the same is true for you. And as you leave, remember, we spend all of our days and our nights doing beginnings and endings. 
Some think when the book is closed, the last page done, that's all there is. I think that closing is opening, that the last page is prelude to the next one, and that the time spent here is parent to the time that is to come. Good journey. Later, perhaps. Let's pray. God, thanks for the chance to acknowledge reality and to know that you and you alone are and will be. But while we are, help us to acknowledge beginnings and endings and put continuings in the middle that make a difference. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.